Good afternoon to those of you east of Ontario and uh, good morning to those west of Ontario and for those of you tuning in from Ontario it's about exactly noon so uh, hi my name is Eric I'm the communications person at the Canadian Psychological Association on behalf of the CPA welcome to the webinar COVID and the Canadian winter uh, four experts from across Canada are joining us to outline some of the issues we as Canadians may have going into the winter amid new restrictions and lockdowns uh, and to provide some ideas about how to cope. Uh, we had scheduled five presenters for today, but unfortunately, Dr. Christine Coral in Vancouver is unable to join us due to an emergency. Uh, we wish her well, and you can still hear her guidance and thoughts uh, concerning depression and anxiety on the CPA podcast, Mindful, available on SoundCloud or wherever you get your podcasts. Our first uh, presenter today uh, works with older adults living with dementia. She's a clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist at Baycrest in Toronto. Uh, please welcome Dr. Yael Goldberg. Thank you, Eric. And thank you everyone for having me here today. So I'm gonna be talking about isolation uh, and dementia during the pandemic. I just have to figure out how to advance the slide. And there we go, okay. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about how to combat the negative impacts of isolation for both ourselves and the older adults in our lives. So we all know that the uh, negative impacts, including loneliness and understimulation, helplessness and anxiety, all lead to uh, negative health outcomes. And so I want to just focus on the positive and focus on ways to combat those. Um, so the first thing I want to remind everyone is to remember the strengths that you do have. This is not the first time in your life where you've had to overcome something challenging. So how did you manage in the past? How did you cope? And can you apply those strengths to the current situation? I also want to remind people to focus on the things that you can control. We can't control the pandemic. We can't control lockdown. But we can control things like what we're going to make for dinner or what time we're going to eat or what we're going to wear so focusing in on those things thinking about the certainties in life what are things that we absolutely know for sure are going to happen like the sun will rise and i i, I love my daughter no matter what that can help us feel grounded in a time which is so uncertain it's also important to be a good uh, responsible consumer of information so there's a lot available out there on different forms of media we want to make sure that we're getting our information from evidence-based sources that we can trust. And we want to monitor our reactions to that as well. If we see that we're getting more anxious, frustrated, or irritated, we may want to taper our exposure to those things. We also want to make sure that we connect with people who have a positive impact on us, people that can create an air of positivity around us. And I will talk about a little bit more about how to connect in a moment. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, there are lots of virtual programs available um, from online support groups to e-visits with using video conferencing where we can chat with our um, older adults who are living in long-term care homes or other acute settings or even who live at home but are just in a different province or a different country than us. There are virtual tour tours available online and different games where you can interact with others online as well. Now you might say, well, my older adult uh, is not comfortable with technology and so that's a huge problem. And my answer to that is that we really need to empower the older adults in our lives um, to become more comfortable with technology. And if you think about it, years ago, older adults didn't use smartphones, but now, 65% of older adults do, and 83% of them use them every single day. The internet, when, when it first became popular, there was a huge resistance, but now older adults, 88% of older adults are using the internet. They're live streaming things like Netflix, and they're using it for telehealth visits with their physicians. Yeah. So we have seen um, some more progress and more um, level of comfort has increased over time. So there is room for us to help them become more engaged socially and connected to loved ones through teaching them how to use the technology. Um, there's an initiative now at Baycrest called uh, Technology Enablement for Older Adults, or T for short, and that focuses on 
making sure that the older adult has the proper device, the proper connectivity, and the proper training on how to use those things. And speaking of empowerment, um, I just want to talk about how we can empower our, our, ourselves and older adults to prevent the cognitive decline that can come from being socially isolated and understimulated by doing these things. So the first um, area of importance is mental stimulation. And this involves anything that challenges your brain to think. So that can be a game, it can be reading, writing, listening, or playing music, anything that gives your brain some, some form of a challenge. And for here, I like to say, use it or lose it. And that is very true. We wanna keep our brains active. We also wanna keep our bodies active. Physical fitness is very important. So exercise, whether it be a lap around your um, hallway in your building or the weather permits, going outside for a walk and diet, making sure that we're eating healthy and not just uh, resorting to comfort food and junk. The other area that I wanna highlight is social engagement. And this is really key. Um, here I'm talking about phone calls, pet visits, whether they're live pets or robotic pets, which are available on the market, Hasbro, has one that's about a hundred bucks, which uh, is very is interactive, so you can pet it and it responds. Um, simulated presence. So by this I mean um, either audio or video that's been pre-recorded by family members or friends. So if you can't actually see each other in person, that there is a recording that your uh, loved one can play whenever they want to feel close to you. Um, video conferencing, you know, Zoom, Skype, FaceTime, those are all excellent ways to connect. Um, and I know that in long-term care homes and acute care settings, they have people on staff to help set those, uh, they call them e-visits. They have that available in most places. Um, virtual programming, like um, tours and, and other things online. And even a book club can be something that you can do even on the phone. Um, the main thing with all these is to implement a structure and a routine. As with all things, knowing when things are going to happen reduces our anxiety and it helps us get through our day better when there are scheduled events. And all of the things that I've talked about today are really to help us create a sense of belonging and safety for the older adults in our lives and for ourselves as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Goldberg. Our next presenter today studies internet-delivered cognitive behavioral therapy at the University of Regina, where she is a professor in the Department of Psychology and a certified cognitive behavior therapist. Welcome, Dr. Heather hadges -Dravopoulos. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Just have to figure out how to advance this slide. There we go. Huh. Um, so as I'm sure many of you know uh, who are on the line today, obtaining therapy in Canada is really quite challenging. Trying to figure out how to get the therapy is a bit like navigating a maze. So first you have to figure out who can provide that therapy. And you have to figure out if you have to pay. After this, you have to navigate the logistics of getting to therapy, something that can be extremely challenging for those who live in rural and remote areas. And after this, you have to figure out how to make the time available to attend therapy week after week over several months. And on top of this, unfortunately, due to concerns about mental health stigma, many people also feel they have to figure out how to get to care but keep that private. The end result is that there's a lot of people in Canada who go without mental health care. And with the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, this is even more pronounced. According to the World Health Organization, who conducted a survey of countries around the world, 93% of countries indicated that access to therapy was disrupted. And on a positive note, though, 70% of those countries said that they responded to that disruption by offering some form of online or virtual therapy. And this is actually, in my opinion, 
very much overdue because there's a lot of evidence that therapy can be effectively and conveniently and efficiently delivered using remote methods. But at least prior to the pandemic, this was not very common. And unfortunately, what this means is that there were many clinicians in Canada who were caught off guard and unprepared to deliver care remotely when the pandemic hit. So the, for the past 10 years, my research has really honed in on a specific form of remotely delivered therapy, namely internet delivered cognitive behavior therapy. So in this type of therapy, it's very different from face-to-face -face therapy. It's also different from remotely delivered therapy, such as therapy over Zoom or over telephone. I think sometimes when I talk about internet delivered therapy, people assume I'm talking about therapists meeting with patients virtually via platforms like Zoom. Um, um, different in a different way. Essentially what happens in internet therapy is that the typical content of face-to-face -face therapy is put online in the form of easy to read standardized lessons that are reviewed by clients over the course of several months. And then at the end of each lesson, clients are presented with activities to basically help with learning. And for some clients, they also have access to therapist support. And most commonly, in the, when it's internet therapy, that support is actually provided um, not by phone or by a video, but by exchanging emails, and typically only once a week. So in internet therapy, basically the materials are designed to do most of the work, and the support is offered as needed um, on the side, like a therapist in your pocket. Uh, so what we found over the past 10 years is that this type of treatment, especially when it's carefully developed in an iterative fashion and incorporates feedback from patients, it's not only acceptable to clients, but it's also very effective and very efficient for many diverse mental health concerns, including depression, anxiety, uh, panic, social anxiety, PTSD, alcohol misuse, chronic pain, and various chronic health conditions. So ultimately, personally, what I'd like to see is that the internet uh, therapy as well as virtual therapy are more readily available in Canada, offering a different doorway to getting mental health care. So I don't think internet therapy or virtual therapy should be the only doorway. But I do think it should be something that is way more available to Canadians on a long-term basis in order to address the undertreatment of mental health problems in Canada and other parts of the world. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hadjus Gavropoulos. Uh, our next presenter. Uh, studies cross-cultural psychology and multicultural counseling as a professor in clinical psychology at the University of Windsor, uh, Dr. Ben C. H. Kuo. The floor is yours. Okay. Hi. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, um, and uh, thank you for the invitation to be a part of this panel on a very important discussion today. So what I would like to um, speak about uh, is racism and the pandemic. So over the last uh, seven, eight months, it uh, seems like we are in a perfect storm where we are facing COVID-19. At the same time, uh, as we all have experienced, we are in the midst of a uh, racial reckonings. Um, all across the US and Canada, perhaps even the world. So what I would like to share um, with the audience today is um, some ideas of what racism is. And so I wanted to start by talking about the different forms of uh, racism. And then in my uh, next slide, I would like to offer some suggestions in terms of strategies and um, coping uh, methods to to respond to the racism that we are facing. So I'm just going to start with some basic uh, terminologies and, and some understanding uh, in the many forms that uh, racism can be manifested. So racism can be manifested uh, individually between person to person. Uh, it could manifest itself in groups 
um, level, one group against another group, or one group and particularly individual. Racism can also takes uh, the form of systemic racism, which you, we have heard a lot uh, in the media, particularly uh, it, most recently we hear um, uh, police brutalities, uh, racism, sexism in the organizations. So systemic racism refers to policy, uh, racism that are actually uh, embedded, uh, uh, deeply entrenched, deep-seated uh, organizational values and uh, um, discrimination partic against a particular group. And also systemic racism could be a result of historical oppression that we have seen through colonialism uh, for many, many uh, hundreds of years that came out of the past and continue on into the present day. So when we talk about racism, we should be thinking about racism that could come from a different directions and uh, being presented at multiple levels. So at times it seems confusing. Um, and the other ways of looking at racism is looking at how racism are expressed. And um, in Canada, we often talk about, um, what I've observed quite interestingly is prior to a uh, recent racial injustice discussion, uh, we have talked about that uh, the difference between overt racism versus covert racism, and that one form is less obvious because of our discussion about multiculturalism, and that refers to the overt uh, racism. So overt racism are expressed in a form of very blatant, very direct, very open manners. So these are referring to something that we when we uh, we think about racist behaviors or act, right? Um, racial slurs, graffitis, um, even violence, these are overt racism. Or they can also um, be expressed in the form of discriminatory laws, policy, and practices against certain groups because of their particular characteristics or assumption about them. So that is an overt that is visible that is something that uh, palatable forms of racism. And we also can think about racism being manifest through covert uh, form. That is, it's kind of racism that is communicated in a much more subtle, indirect, and sometimes ambiguous manners. And, and this uh, oftentimes, um, and we are seeing in um, uh, everyday lives, um, including healthcare practice, practitioners in the forms of what's called implicit biases. So these are unconscious biases about a particular group that may not be uh, fully um, uh, on the surface being aware um, for that individual who committed this kind of um, racism. And we recently, psychological literature also talked about microaggressions so these are defined as everyday, very subtle form of slights that uh, are being used against um, people of color. And they are ambiguous in that they are not obvious or overt as we described previously. And it's hard to put fingers on these kind of more small, subtle aggression against um, people of color. So, these are basic um, concepts to help us kind of frame what racism look like. And um, I would like to, to now talk about some of the ways um, to cope with and respond to racism. So obviously we are dealing with a lot of stress. We're seeing this in the media. And so what do we do? So I'm just gonna offer a few ideas. So it's important to call the Racist Act uh, as we seize it. And the reason that it's important because once we are able to identify a racist act, rather than staying in limbo, not sure whether it's racist act or not, having that confirmation, having that confidence, then an individual who is a target or groups that is target of that racist act can then respond accordingly in a more concrete way. So as um, individual, we should, when we observe racist act, 
it is our responsibility to actually challenge and identify it and uh, communicate that um, that the racial acts are there and to be able to then address it. Um, the other suggestion is to seek support for those people who are the target of, of racist racism is to seek support from trusted others, communities and allies and people who understand share the same values to communicate about the hurt, the pain and even ideas to how to go forward. And um, for individuals, we should commit ourselves to be an ally for uh, people of color or individuals who are groups who are oppressed to commit ourselves to stand by those who are hurt or harmed and then committed to real changes with tangible actions. And I think we can think about these actions not necessarily in a very big, uh, very uh, confrontative way, even though that might be very important and appropriate, but we can all do things in small or big ways. That means maybe communicating with your children, teaching them about uh, how to deal with racism. So it could be small and big, but commitment to do something concrete with actions. And lastly, my suggestion would be to commit it to recognize and monitor our own privileges and tendency to co bias view. It is very difficult that we, we see our own privileges, uh, whatever the, the circumstances we are. But we need to realize that um, we, we all live in certain uh, privileged conditions and that we are also um, prone to have our own v values and views that are as, as a part of our uh, cultural conditioning. Once we are able to recognize that, it allows to really truly become more open and more observant of what the racist um, situation that happened to us. And it gives us a greater empathy to support those who are in need. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. We do have some questions that were sent in in advance of this uh, webinar. Uh, and we'll start with one for uh, Dr. Goldberg. Uh, Susan uh, wrote in and said, my husband has younger onset dementia and is moving into the later stages. Uh, so he can connect with family over Zoom on his iPad, but he rarely recognizes them and gets frustrated easily. Uh, and sometimes he doesn't understand what the iPad does or that the people on it are speaking to him. Uh, so it's difficult and stressful for our children, even though they're patient and understanding. Is it worth continuing to connect this way? And is there a way to help make this a less stressful experience for everyone? Well, Susan, that's, a great question and i'm sorry that you're having to deal with that right now that's it's very very tough especially in a situation like yours when the needs of the different people in the family conflict right so the children have a need to connect with their father uh, but your husband has a need to not be agitated and to preserve his sense of or his quality of life so it's a real balancing act um, when we think about person-centered care we want to guide any of our decisions based on what is in your husband's best interests. And we want to think about ways that we can maximize the communication experience. So is there a way for him to, um, or a way for the children to see him remotely without him getting frustrated? Can you perhaps prepare him in advance for the communication experience? Maybe tell him, you know, Hun, we're going to see the kids soon and maybe show him some pictures and remind him about who everyone is and then do the video conference together. So sit next to him, hold his hand, give him a time frame, say we're going to do this for five minutes so that he knows that there's an end coming and it's sort of closed, right? Um, make sure that the kids on the other end have good lighting so that he can see them well. And it might be a good idea for them to wear the same clothes each time they um, connect so that they become familiar to him. Uh, they, they'll want to make sure that they have minimal distractions around on their end and the device is positioned so that it's clear mm -hmm. and that everyone just understands the need to be flexible with it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so if, if he's getting agitated, then perhaps they could turn off their camera so that they could still see him, but that not the other way around so he wouldn't be agitated by their presence on the other end um, and with with all things it's important to create a consistent schedule for these sorts of visits so building it into the structure of his day or if it's not daily but you know if it's every monday 
or twice a week, whatever it is, so that it becomes part of his routine. Thank you so much, Dr. Goldberg. Uh, an excellent answer and some great advice. Uh, it looks like we have Dr. Hubbard back on the line. Uh, Janine, the floor is yours. Uh, welcome. Um, thank you. It's a fabulous, sorry, there's nothing like technology glitches, which is quite frankly, let's face it, folks, what we've gotten used to over the last eight, nine months. Flexibility is the name of the game in this COVID uh, life we're living. Um, so I briefly wanted to talk about the impact of COVID on parents and kids. Um, and bear with me because I'm having to do this on my phone instead of my laptop. So I'm attempting to move slides. So big areas that this has obviously had an impact on. Families, um, all of these have had good and bad influences. For some families, uh, the forced togetherness has actually worked really well in terms of some bonding and some closeness that maybe didn't exist. And for some, that closed confinement uh, has caused a whole lot of increased uh, conflict for sure. We've seen an impact on schooling, my goodness, uh, for the number of people who struggle with independent learning with parents who've been trying to juggle being parents and teachers and working from home at the same time. Um, on perhaps a positive note, uh, we've had a number of parents notice or perhaps really tune into attentional and learning issues in their children that perhaps were raised in the past, but they kind of dismissed or they you know, hadn't really focused on it. Um, and so we've seen a real surge and a real increase in referrals for things like ADHD and learning disability concerns. The other thing is it's actually helped kids learn some of their learning strategies. And we've had a few kids really flourish with some of the online uh, learning piece. Socializing, obviously, we know that this has been radically different for kids and teens. And at various points of the pandemic, the ability to socialize or not socialize or learn how to socialize differently has had a massive impact, especially on our teens and young adults. And not surprisingly, we know that electronic use has skyrocketed both for academics and work for all of us, as well as as a coping mechanism and vitally as a form of socialization and communication. Uh, so one of the things that I've had a lot of talk with people about is, yes, the use of electronics has skyrocketed, but you want to look very carefully at what type of electronic use is happening, because not all electronic use and not all social media is necessarily, you know, evil and going to rot their brains. Um, and then the last area that we've really seen are, is the mental health. And I mean, we've seen this across all populations, of course. Uh, and for a lot of kids, early stage of the pandemic, uh, actually, they stopped attending therapy sessions, even via Zoom, because they were like, all of my issues are related uh, to school concerns. They're related to uh, academics. They're related to social anxiety. And I'm not having to worry about them anymore. Uh, Newfoundland, we reopened our schools here in September and all of the kids who had been ignoring those issues over the summer, we suddenly saw skyrocketing. So if I can give one piece of advice for the other provinces where you have a lot more kids being homeschooled, if there are kids who had pre-existing issues around school attendance or school avoidance, please address them now because we struggled when kids were out of school for six months, including the summer holidays. I can only begin to imagine what it's going to look like for a lot of students come next September. And then I just wanted to share with you a um, big message uh, that I talk about, especially around some of the socialization. in terms of the how come so-and-so's family has different rules than I do and uh, you know how come you're not letting me do the things I want to do throughout this pandemic it's important to remember focus on the things you have control over and as much as you can let go of the things that you can't and yes this is my favorite quote from an interview I did uh, video games will not rot your kids brains I promise we've been using them differently um, and you know certainly happy to talk a bit more about that and then remembering as we've been learning, we interact differently, but differently isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, and on that note, I'm going to hold that our luck has been good and I'm going to pass it back over to Eric. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. <laughs> Hubbard. Uh, my my son just got the new cyberpunk video game uh, yesterday. It's very hotly anticipated, so I'm glad to know uh, his brain won't be <laughs> melting. 
while he plays that uh, all day today. Uh, I am going to press our luck a little bit, though, while we do have you on the line. And I'm going to ask you one of the questions that we've got here from Jason. Uh, It says, how can my husband and I help our teenagers stay motivated on schoolwork when the school experience now is only about the work and doesn't include any of the social or recreational activities that usually help keep them engaged? That is such a common struggle, and I'm I'm really glad you asked that question because we forget, again, psychologists, we're kind of a geeky group. We tended to like school going through. Uh, for a lot of kids, and especially teens, the academic aspect of school, they tolerate at bare minimum, and the reason they're there is so they can play sports, so they can do the extracurricular activities, so they can hang out with their buddies, uh, and we've robbed them of that. We've taken that aspect away. So it's figuring out how do we substitute some of those things. And some of it depends on whether your uh, teen is doing synchronous or asynchronous learning in classes. Um, But we remember the importance of those small social interactions. So allowing uh, some time for some texting, some social media, some FaceTime, whatever you want to do with their peers between classes in the same way that they might normally, um, as well as arranging for study dates or perhaps encouraging group projects. Um, Again, there's no harm in asking the teacher. You might be surprised because they're having to be really super flexible. Um, But figuring out ways that you can provide, uh, even I know some of my older teenagers are having what they call study dates, where literally they're just connecting via Zoom or FaceTime or something. They're both sitting working on their homework. And they're chit-chatting from time to time, um, but it's helping keep each other motivated. It's helping them keep each other on task, and it's still providing that social element. In terms of the extracurriculars, those are really tough. Um, and again, figuring out what you might be able to do to substitute. If it's a kid who's used to being really physically active, involved in team sports that they're not able to do, helping them to figure out, well, what are some ways that we can continue to keep you uh, physically fit so that you're feeling healthy, um, and then figure out some substitute activities that you might be able to do with the buddies from the hockey team that you're not able to be out on the ice with. So again, it's all about being creative. It's all about finding new solutions. Terrific. Thank you for that answer. And we're going to press our luck just a little bit more and ask you one more question uh, <laughs> sure while you're thing. here and uh, connected. And you touched on this a little bit in your presentation. I guess uh, we'll just ask you to expand on it a little bit. Sure. Uh, my daughter's friends are telling her all about their plans for Christmas and visiting their grandparents and families in other provinces. Uh, she's nine and has a hard time understanding why we won't be doing the same thing. Uh, is there a way to explain this to her without telling her that her friends' families are being irresponsible? Although that's probably in your mind what you would really like to be saying, uh, keeping that in check. Uh, partly, I think it's important to explain to kids that this experience does look very different across this country. Um, that we know that, again, here in Newfoundland and Labrador, we've been exceedingly lucky. In fact, we feel a little guilty. Um, so that we have been able to participate in some social activities that I know have just not been possible in some of the other provinces. So sometimes it's putting it within that context. And then really it's the, like I say, that uh, slide that I had about focusing on what you can control as opposed to talking to her about what they're doing. Emphasize that every family is different. Every family has life circumstances that allow them to make different decisions and then focus in on the here's what we're doing and okay absolutely there are things that you are feeling missing out on let's grieve that that's more than that but then let's look at the holidays and what are the things that were really important to you in the past what are the things that you really enjoyed and let's figure out ways to make that happen so maybe it was sitting and you know playing a board game well we've now figured out how to do that virtually so you can still get the cousins around the table um or play a game of bingo or hang out and you can still exchange the gifts it might take a little bit more time in the mail but there are all the same ways of doing it but focus helping your child focus on what she can do herself and not focusing on the actions of others thank you dr hubbard and uh, i'm glad we got our uh, connection issues how are we doing there eric very well. That was great. Thank you. Uh, now I have a question uh, moving on to uh, Dr. Hagis Gavropoulos. Uh, 
And Karen asks, I had a therapist before the pandemic with whom I was very comfortable speaking in person, uh, but now that we're doing therapy virtually, I'm less comfortable with him than I was before, even though I'm quite at ease with Zoom calls for work and other virtual platforms for other reasons. Uh, is this normal? And is it okay for me to seek another therapist? Yeah. Um, so what I can tell you is that um, delivering care virtually or via ICBT or internet therapy is pretty near novel for a lot of therapists. And I don't think that when um, therapists went into psychology, they had in mind that they would be delivering care via Zoom or um, through emails. And I think um, what I've noticed with ICBT and internet therapy is that some adapt really quickly and others kind of struggle with it. Um, and it isn't that comfortable. And I think that's true of clients as well. Um, even, even when they're kind of used to being on Zoom or technology, that um, some adapt and others struggle. And I think uh, for any therapist who's on the line, uh, what I would say is, that one of the number one recommendations, whether you're delivering internet therapy through email or Zoom or telephone, is to frequently check in with clients and see how they're doing and if they're having any challenges. And I think um, what you find is that that process of checking in is helpful and actually helps normalize this experience for clients. And um, often that's actually enough in and of itself, um, but if uh, clients are open about sort of what's going on, you can brainstorm sort of how to overcome the challenges. Um, but what I would say 100%, if you're not comfortable with your therapist, what's most important is that you have somebody that you're comfortable with and that you get the care that you need. So um, therapists are used to that, uh, that clients sometimes don't connect with them and, and will switch. And so that, that would be perfectly fine. Thank you for that. Very uh, helpful and informative, Dr. Hadjis Devropoulos. Uh, our next question is for Dr. Kuo. Uh, and you touched on this, uh, Dr. Kuo, in your presentation a little bit as well. Uh, but uh, the question is, I find that when I see racism online and I call it out, it ends up being someone looking for a fight just for the sake of fighting. Uh, and it never changes anyone's mind or attitude. I do it hoping that someone else sees the conversation and gets persuaded but I'm not sure that happens at all. Is it worth doing it online when uh, I'm worried that all I'm doing is giving a platform to someone who wants a fight? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, let me, let me um, address the second part of that question first, and that is, is it worthwhile to actually address uh, racism um, online or uh, in person? Uh, which one is 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 better off? I would definitely say that it, with any difficult subject, such as a discussion of uh, racial injustice, um, it's definitely if you have a choice to be uh, speaking to that person uh, face to face. And the reason is because topic like this is so emotionally charged, and so having that opportunity to actually see the person in front of you, so that you see can see. Uh, their emotion, um, their body language, their nonverbals, and allows you to better understand their motivations. And based on those feedback, I think there will be a much more responsive and effective communication when you meet that person having conversation about the topic face-to-face. Uh, -to -face. So definitely, if there's choice, uh, have that conversation um, um, in person. And then to uh, the first part of the question is about picking fight and the, the platform or online uh, as a way of, of kind of expressing your, your opinions about um, racial issues. As we know, online platform, social media um, it is not a particularly um, helpful platform to talk about controversials or emotionally charged issues because the anonymity. Um, of the persons who is communicating. We don't see the person. We don't have a relationship with person who are making certain comments. I would say definitely for your perspective, it's helpful, as I mentioned earlier, when you see something that is racist, 
do call them out. However, I would suggest that when we are expressing and communicating online our opinion, that we adjust our expectation and ask ourselves, what is it that we hope to achieve uh, in, in uh, communicating our point? So if my point is trying to get uh, convinced the persons who are acting in racist ways or vocalizing the racist way and trying to change their opinion, it may or may not happen. So um, I think we need to understand perhaps if my motivation is so that I can make a point, I stand my ground and so I can make voice my opinion and that's my goal. And I think if that's the goal, we should be able to go in and uh, making our point and knowing that we will accept whatever the responses from other people um, will be, whether they are for or against. Um, so I think having a appropriate expectation of what the reaction from the other person in that online format would help us to adjust our expectation and attitude. And perhaps um, it's, being able to say what I want to say and then walk away and then trusting that maybe someone will hear and others won't and but that's okay because I've done what I needed to do. So thank you for that question. And thank you for that answer. Uh, that's terrific. Very good advice. Uh, stand your ground and say what it is you want to say. Our next question is for Dr. Goldberg. Uh, Diane is asking, how can I help my mom reach out to other people around her? Uh, she lives alone in another province. We speak on the phone every day, but she doesn't talk to her friends or neighbors, and she doesn't go online. I worry that I'm the only contact that she has with the rest of the world. Well, thank you for your question, Diane, and I'm sure that there are a lot of people out there that are facing the same thing as you. Um, I would start off by f trying to find out why she's not talking to friends or neighbors and why she's not going online. So kind of do some investigating. Um, try to identify what the barriers are for her. What are her hesitations? What are her worries? What are her fears? Maybe she feels embarrassed to initiate contact. Maybe she thinks she's going to be rejected and she's afraid of that. Maybe she feels it's intrusive to just call someone out of the blue. Um, for online, you know, find out what her issue is. Does she have the proper device? Is it working? Does she know how to operate it properly? Is she set up with an internet connection? So just do some, um, you know, troubleshooting around what some of the issues are that are preventing her engaging socially in these ways. And then once you find out what the problems are, then work collaboratively collaboratively with her to address each barrier. So you want to strategize how to overcome each of these things individually by creating a plan, right? So for example, you know, if she says she's uh, hesitant to make the first contact, maybe offering your help in making the first contact with her, either with her, so you're on the line with her, or for her, so you reach out on her behalf. Another thing could be um, suggesting scheduled phone calls, so that each time is not a new um, responsibility on her part to initiate, but once she has made contact, then it's, you know, she knows that every Monday at 10 o'clock, she's going to have Zoom coffee with, you know, Lucy. Um, you can also ask her for if, if she would like your help in scheduling different things. Um, if the issue is that she is just not motivated, work with her and try to find ways to motivate her. Explain to her that you're worried about her, you would like her to be mo more socially connected to help maintain her mental fitness. Um, offer her incentives, you know, um, see what really would, would get her going um, and try to offer those things to her. And this whole entire approach really requires uh, that you ask questions in a very non judgmental way, really listening to what her responses are and meeting her where she's at to try to work with her um, to help to help her feel more comfortable. So it's it's really a matter of putting your own agenda and your own worries aside, which are very valid for the record, but just putting those aside and trying to focus in on 
who she is and what her needs are and how you can help her meet those needs. And sometimes people are not aware uh, of what they need to do in order to be healthy, whether it be physically or mentally or emotionally. And so you can you can make your suggestions, but in a way that she feels non is non threatening. Uh, the you know there's a um, concept that you catch more flies with honey than vinegar. And so just being very open to what she has to say and working with her to help her overcome some of these challenges that she's facing. Thank you, Dr. Goldberg. And uh, Diane, I hope that helps you out with your question. Uh, our next question is for Dr. Hadjistavropoulos. Uh, it's Hamid who is asking, how would you suggest I prepare for a virtual CBT session? Uh, should I be in a quiet room by myself? Can I eat a snack? Can I bring one of my kids to participate if they want to? Yeah, um, that, that's actually a good question. In general, I would say um, what you want to do when you're meeting with a client virtually or if you were working on an internet therapy program is that you would want to be in a quiet room probably on your own so that you can focus in on uh, the therapy. Uh, that said, um, I guess one of the things about being at home is that there sometimes there are distractions that you can't um, overcome. And so I guess I would talk with your therapist um, about that, about having kids in the room. And I guess, you know, there might be some problems where that actually could be uh, helpful to you. So I think it comes back to that thing that I said in the previous answer, where that communication with your therapist and um, around what works for you is most important. Thank you. Thank you for that answer, and uh, I hope that helps as well. Uh, our final question today uh, is again a question for Dr. Kuo. And it's Richard who is asking, how can I talk to my kids about racism at an early age, like before the age of 10, both to help them become respectful human beings of conscious and to inoculate them against going down a racist path later in their lives as they get online and may be influenced by the ideas and opinions of peers and others. Thank you. Thank you, Richard, for the question. Um, I would say that there's no better time than uh, talking about uh, issues of race, racism and racial recognition uh, now than um, um, ever really because two reasons um one is given the societal climate because uh, we have seen on the news social media um reports about uh here in canada truth and reconciliation movement the black lives matter movement these are um inundated in our um news cycles so there are a lot of information that are there accessible for kids that they are seeing, hearing, and being you know, exposed to. So having this conversation at this time of history, I think is better than any other time of history because it's, it's in a way in our face and including our children. Um, and secondly, um, having conversation of this, this uh, subject matter at early age, is critical because from developmental psychology uh, research, we know that kids actually understand a lot more than we think as adults think they know. So I think as soon as I think as parents realize and kids are able, are receptive to this a discussion of race and racism, uh, that's when we need to begin. Um, so yes, it's a good idea to start talking with kids and uh, our children early on this topic. And so the, the question about how to do that, so I will offer three uh, suggestions and uh, for parents. Uh, how, to, how to have this conversation with, with your kids? And I'm a parent of two boys, uh, one who is 10. So 
this is also reflected of my personal experience uh, about MDM, my role as a psychologist. One is what I call uh, incidental learning. So these are unplanned, unstructured uh, opportunity to have conversation with our children about race and racism. So um, these are something perhaps example is watching TV with your child, they came by and watch this news about protests or driving down the street and seeing neighborhood, there's protest uh, nearby in the neighborhood or that uh, conversation over the dinner table that kids overheard uh, their classmates about saying something related to uh, this, this ra racism topic. And so using that opportunity in a very natural way to say, hey, what do you think? And so what does that mean to you? And inviting our kids to talk about these in a very natural and a very um, unstructured way. So this become a part of our uh, communication interaction with our kids. And then we can offer them of our thoughts and opinion and even some coaching. Secondly, um, I would call this more intentional learning. And uh, as with all the difficult subjects with talking with kids, um, it's helpful to have something visual. So I would suggest, in fact, there are a lot of resources, uh, children's books, even for young children, pictures books um, about race and racism cultural and diversity issues. Uh, there are incredibly amount, uh, if parents can do a little bit of uh, research online or talk to your um, librarians in your local libraries for suggestions on books that tailor and design for children that deal with culture and diversity issue. Um, I think most parents will find surprising that there are quite a lot. And so, in a way, in the mediums that it's very accessible to children, story, characters, and allow them from there early to be reading about these complex issues, but in a way, again, interesting, engaging, moving, and that they can relate to. And finally, my suggestion would be uh, for parents to talk about difficult topics such as race and racism is to look up some resources. There are free resources uh, available for everyone parents, how to um, talk to your kids, how to have this conversation. And I'm thinking about, for example, American Psychological Association has uh, free resources specifically about coaching and giving tips to parents how to uh, broach the topic with, with your children. So I definitely ask parents to uh, look into those resources. So I think there are multiple ways that we can um, do this, and it's always very powerful very useful and effective when we start having this conversation with our kids early. Thank you. And back to you, Eric. Thank you, Dr. Kuo. Uh, thank you so much to everybody who participated in the webinar here today. Uh, Dr. Janine Hubbard of the Association of Psychology in Newfoundland and Labrador, Dr. Yael Goldberg of Baycrest in Toronto, Dr. Kuo at the University of Windsor, uh, and Dr. Heather Hadjistovropoulos at the University of Regina. Thank you also to everybody who tuned in. This webinar will be available as a video recording. The CPA will be releasing that as soon as it is available. Uh, so look for that and share it with anyone else. And all of the participants on today's webinar have also been participants on the CPA podcast, Mindful. So you can listen to them there for a more in-depth and longer explanation of each of the subjects they covered today. Uh, thank you once again, everybody, and big thanks to David Mercer. He is the uh, Education and Professional Development Advisor at the CPA and did all of the behind the scenes work for today's webinar, uh, which was an awful lot of work. So thank you, David. Thank you, everybody, and take care.